Every three months, we witness an event in markets called quadruple witching. There's trillions of dollars at stake, and it's happening this Friday, which has all of us as traders and investors paying attention. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Daily Show, where we talk about stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. Today, we'll be covering off on the CTAs, the dark pool activity, and of course, the maximum pain levels that you need to be looking at this week. But more importantly than that, there's lots of abundance and opportunity in these markets right now. And what we've just seen is some capitulation in one of the world's favorite stocks. Let's take a look together right now. Well, one thing's for sure right now, markets are just getting more and more interesting. And some of the rallies that we spoke about over the last 24 hours certainly did happen, while we also saw some stocks fall, such as Tesla and semiconductors, in what could be considered a dead cat bounce. One thing's for sure, though, the markets still remain greedy in terms of most metrics. But let's take a look at some of the macro and data points before we get into the key levels. So the NASDAQ has just spent one year above its 200-day moving average, and that enters it into a special time. And of course, a couple of stats that I thought were interesting to start with today's video. We'll be looking more at it from a technical analysis base later on. But as you can see here, there's two things that we can take out of this chart. If you remain bullish as an investor in markets, over the next 12 to 18 months, there's a good chance that markets will continue higher. Why? They always did in every one of these other circumstances. The other thing, though, that's interesting for correction players is that there is a good chance there will be a cheaper price over the next 86 days. And one of the reasons for that is that we do tend to see pullbacks and some form of potential mean reversion over these periods. Now, what kinds of things could bring mean reversion? Well, we've talked about CTAs, and if it's your first time here, welcome, subscribe if you like the content, and we're going to talk about commodity trade advisors. Now, this is a Goldman Sachs chart we've been bringing up recently, which is showing you that in their models, they basically were looking at CTAs, which are heavily overbought, potentially selling moving forward. So what does this mean? Well, when CTAs start to reduce, it can mean that the end of a trend is coming, and they're often a little bit early with markets moving a little bit higher after these events. So have we started to see CTAs reduce? Well, as promised, I thought we'd bring you some more charts. So let's take a look at what the CTAs are doing so far. They've been reducing a little bit here on the NASDAQ recently. And funnily enough, it's been the worst of the market sectors. The other thing that we've been seeing is S&P 500 small reductions, although that did uptick over the last couple of trading days. So no matter what sentiment indicator you're seeing right now, you'll notice that all of them are stretched. The bears are gone and bulls are here to stay. And according to this Goldman Sachs report, it shows us that we're back at a skew level or a sentiment level that's also very, very similar to basically June and July of last year. Now, if you know your markets, you would know that this was a period where we hit some FOMO, we topped off, and then we sold off all the way into the October period. Now, will it happen again? Well, one thing's for sure, no one's buying put protection. And you can see this really illustrated by this skew chart, which shows that calls are everywhere and puts are nowhere to be seen yet. But the most important thing of all is going to be whether we go into a negative gamma environment. Right now, we've been in positive gamma for months and months and months. If that changes on the S&P and we'll give you some of the key levels where we believe it's going to change, it's going to be a big deal. Let's talk about single stock options, volume versus share volume. We're back to 2021 levels again, which means that everybody is speculating across the market and it's leading into many stocks starting to see that speculation. Over the last 24 hours, we talked about PayPal potentially coming back. And guess what? It started to find some bullish movement. We've also seen coin. We've also seen, of course, crypto. And really all of these hyper growth stocks are sitting with interesting bases that have started to pick up, notably things like Block, SE and many others that came from 2021. So little wonder that we're running when we see single stock options with such huge movements in them. Wall Street's getting involved, retail traders like you and I are getting involved, and there's some big moves out there. Let's talk about one of the most boring metals in the world. Well, I think it's not boring, but of course, we all, many of you in the comments do say so, and that's gold. Now, I've been a bit of a bull on gold for the last couple of weeks, and the reason why is because Gold, I know, tends to run into rate cuts. Now, in particular, we're most likely still going into a rate cut environment at some point over the next 12 to 18 months, which obviously the Fed has kind of been talking about. The market believes it's coming. Now, gold does tend to run into these events and it tends to sustain through the cuts as well. So it could be an interesting time to look at gold, even at all-time highs. And more importantly, we've talked about gold stocks outperforming gold itself. 
And so far, that's been an exceptionally good trade because, of course, at the moment, GDX was one of the best performers over the last five days and over the last one day of trade. And I expect gold stocks to continue their rally, especially if yields end up dropping off. What about gold's percentage of number of positive returns? Well, funnily enough, it hasn't had so many positive returns in quite some time. It's pretty extended, there's no doubt, in gold spot, but it's still a great beginning of potentially a run here. And you can see that in previous periods, there were points in time where gold had had big runs, it felt good, and then it had a bit of a pullback, and of course, it ended up rallying up more. So it is a bit exhausted in the current trend trade, but we'll be looking at it later on the charts. Let's now talk about weird activity in markets. So SMCI has been one we've been following around, and I'm not 100% convinced by the rally. Obviously, we had two massive trades the other day that ended up went moving into this rally level, but I cannot ignore this candle here. It was a huge one, and somebody certainly was dumping off in the position. Now, it just got upgraded by many different firms, and then we saw a big trade. In fact, it's the number one largest trade on it for quite some time, and it's happening right at these highs. So if we do end up getting a breakout to the new high, well, you can probably assume it's going to be a squeeze. And if we break out to a new low, you can probably assume it's going to be a fairly negative style market. So something of interest, certainly in this coiling zone, we know there's a big player involved. Another one has been Tesla recently. Now, Tesla, of course, has been getting beaten down really badly in the 2024 market. It's the worst of the MAG7. And you could almost say, well, maybe it's not part of the MAG7 anymore because realistically, it's so weak compared to those other AI stocks. Now, it is coming into a very interesting level. And we just saw a big dark pool transaction, which is illustrated by this big circle here, coming through. Now, the last time we've seen these big circles, you can see they were near bottoms and they were near tops. And I see a lot of polarizing figures talking about Tesla right now in terms of what their expectations are. Now, let's talk about our longer term goals on the market. What do we think markets will actually do over the next 12 to 18 months? So for a long time, we've talked about the stats. They're mostly bullish, let's be real. And they generally have one or two corrections over the period uh, in between. So in general, yeah, the sentiment is mostly bullish over the election year into the start of 2025. The thing is, though, what is going to perform better? Well, in my expectation, I'm going to think that Russell 2000 stocks and mid caps continue to perform pretty well throughout the rest of the year. I think there's a big opportunity in smaller caps in particular, especially if we do start to get rate cuts. They are the most susceptible to rate cuts and rate hikes. So if we do start to see rate cuts by the Fed, expect that to become a bit of a catalyst for that particular market. But the reason I want to bring this up is because, of course, we're looking at around a 20 times for the S&P 500. Now, is that expensive? Yeah, that's pretty expensive in terms of forward PE. But you'd be surprised how long markets can rally. And just a few years ago, back in 2021, we saw a market that was rallying out of control when it comes to PE. So you've got to expect the unexpected as a possibility in these markets. And I just want to kind of bring this up, that if we do go into a super bull run, they tend to be over 25 PE before actually crashing in a proper way. And this is the type of feeling that I think many of us are getting in this market right now. And it could be a little bit longer to go. So remember, when it comes to bull runs, it's very, very difficult to figure out exactly what the PE should be. And most of the time, it will disconnect from reality. That is one of the things that is always a big part of it. And it's happening right now in probably the crypto universe, and it will probably happen over the next year. But remember, this time's a little bit different because yes, semiconductors are expensive, but really there are semi-cheap stocks in the markets right now. So the opportunity that we'll be covering on this show, and of course anywhere, is quite good. And we've already been illustrating that with so many of the recent picks that we've been talking about that are completely left of field, such as the China stocks, and of course, recently copper, gold, and oil as well. So let's now talk about S&P 500 performance during OPEX and post. So this is the trillions of dollars of options expiration. And I think you can all see here that it generally, according to Wayne's data, is positive in the OPEX week, which is happening right now and it's pretty negative the week after. Now, this is not taking into consideration election years only, which of course were usually negative first week and then positive the next week. It is taking into consideration all of the OPEX weeks. So because a lot of these election stats aren't necessarily working as well this year, we thought we'd just bring it off like this. So it shows you that it, next week in particular, if it's going to happen and they're going to let the floodgates out, it's a pretty damning stat for the market course, price action will need to be had and we'll be looking for that on the charts. 
In terms of long-term investors, of course, 25 and zero is the general way we've looked at it. And we continue to really maintain this. I think we'll be having a couple of corrections throughout this period of time, as we always do. However, at the same point, generally speaking, the stats are bullish in these markets right now for the longer term and middle term investors. Let's now take a look at the options market coming into the options expiration. So we know here that the options expiration is obviously the 15th. And you can see that 5200, no matter which day of the week, is quite a big one. In fact, you can see here during the Thursday or Thursday move, we've got a 5175 strike that's quite big. And movements above the 5175 and then the 5200 level will end up creating potential further positive gamma shifts and force the market to obviously hedge off a little bit, which could cause a little bit of a squeeze. On the flip side of that, we've got maximum pain levels and negative gamma areas. So you can see here that the negative gamma area over the next 24 hours sits at around 5130 and the negative gamma area sits around 5100 for the 15th. And I think 5100 is still the key on these markets. In fact, I think it's actually about 5095 in terms of what we're seeing from the technical level, because that was the last low that we saw, which was wicked above. And we'll bring that up later on today's show. But that is going to be a big zone for markets. So if you're a bear, you really want it underneath around that 5095. And if you're a bull, you just want it to hold above this really area. If it breaks through 5200, then you get excited about the next level. So let's talk upcoming calendar events. As we know, there's a little bit of information coming out over the next 24 hours. Core retail sales and PPI. Both of these will become important. And of course, the expectations for retail sales is a big rebound from the January position. Will we get it? If we don't, will it become volatile? We'll look at the key levels that we need to be watching. But one thing's for sure, rotation continues to go on in these markets. And there are a couple of stocks that did quite well over the last 24 hours. Yeah, it wasn't semiconductors, but it was gold, it was energy, and it was the other one we've been talking about recently together on this channel. So you guys are pretty smart. We've got the utilities, we've got the energy, and we've got the gold at this stage. And it brings us to a five-day total because, of course, we're looking at defensive markets to see whether they're actually picking up where gold has been the best performer and you wouldn't believe it, the worst performer of the last kind of five months becomes one of the best. Energy comes out of the 3.72%, helped a little bit by long-term futures action on oil breaking out, but uh, recent spot still sitting underneath that 80 level, although it did improve. And of course, we can see here the defensive markets such as staples and utilities sitting right in the middle. So semiconductors have kind of fallen out of focus as we saw that big sell-off last week, but options are still just heating up. Now, we did have a massive day of options, 42.15 versus 41.8, 57% calls, and of course, we had only 27% retail trading participation. So it was a little bit down and it was pretty concentrated into a couple of stocks. But you'll notice here that there were large moves throughout MSTR, which is getting a lot of discussion at the moment. And in general, we were getting pretty even on the S&P and Qs in terms of puts and calls. And this is something pretty rare. Although it was only 0.92, there were more calls bought on the Qs than the puts. And this was a day that was actually negative. I haven't seen that in a while, so I definitely thought I'd announce it, but it was interesting. Let's now take a look at the charts overall. VIX 16 remains the level where the bears take control. At the moment, we're in single stock and sector selection, and we've been talking about that. VIX underneath 20, that's usually what you're looking at. A few of you have asked, what are you doing with copper? I've been reading your comments, so thank you very much for your comments, guys. Massive appreciation, by the way, for the thumbs up and all of the comments. And I do want to quickly apologize about these charts in the previous two videos. I know they were flickering everywhere, and I don't know what was happening with the hardware. But anyway, it should be fixed for this video, so thumbs up for that. Let's talk about high-yield junk bonds. A lot of people have been asking, will we see this be an important chart? Uh, the simple answer is, I think, yes. When this eventually breaks out of a coil, it will tell us a lot about the markets. Now, realistically, we actually saw high yield junk do pretty well considering yields were up a little bit over the last 24 hours, but this is a coil and you should have alerts set on both the top and the bottom. If it breaks, it's going to be important. Speaking of coils, our other overall bond indicator is also coiling at this stage. It showed some weakness over the last couple of weeks, then it strengthened off. It's giving us a neutral reading at this stage. If it does break to the downside of 1.14, then of course we expect markets to get sold and if it breaks to the upside, we expect markets to be bought up. Yields themselves, they're reaching a bit of an interesting area. And I've got here a FIB that I'll just pop on the charts. So we've gone back to a 61.8 or a golden pocket style FIB area. And this is certainly where I'm looking for 
overall yields to probably start to drop back off. Now, they should do it around here. Of course, retail sales is coming. That might be something that begins a catalyst. And if we get through 4.75 and close on the US two-year yield, expect the markets to start to really not like that. Specifically, Russell 2K would sell pretty hard, I think, if we manage to get through 4.75. So yields are still in focus. What about central bank liquidity? Here we've got the Fed. Here we've got worldwide central bank liquidity. Both are dropping, but the Fed is dropping a little bit faster. So technically, some of the accommodative, let's say, liquidity in the markets has been dropping in recent days. It's been pretty neutral for a while. It bumped up and now it's come back down. So if that ends up getting more substantial, I think it could have an effect on markets. For now, though, not probably enough. What about the American consumer? This is a great combo code for all of us to have on our charts, and it's the XLY versus XLP, so consumer discretionary versus staples. You can see here that it's not exactly looking like the American consumer is feeling great, and I expect this one to move a little bit over the next 24 hours with retail sales. If we end up breaking to a new low, and obviously if we ever get through 220, which is worthwhile having an alert on this one, then it marks a kind of bad point for markets. For now, though, it's still making a series of overall higher highs and higher lows. So something to watch, and we will be putting it on the charts from time to time for now. Now, copper, it finally did it, everyone. We got through 3.95. Now, we suspected that we would in the previous video because, of course, we saw that overall there's a bit of copper constraint coming in, artificial copper constraint, by the way. It's turning into uh, into oil, and we broke, broke through and went to 4.05. So at this point, we'd expect a 4.15 kind of read moving forward and even maybe a 4.2 on copper. So a nice breakout there. The stocks have been doing well for a while, and they had a decent 24 hours. Copper looking pretty good, and it may put some pressure on some of the stock market as well later on. What about the US dollar? Well, the US dollar futures gapped down, as you can see here, and it's remained really the best trade in the currency world, at least for me, has been realistically looking at euro long. And we've been doing this for a while now on the channel, and obviously I'm liking what I see over the last 24 hours with a nice little breakout above that key level we spoke about, which means that I think a pullback will be met by bull demand if it does happen. We may be breaking through 109.80 for the currency traders out there, and of course, that could bring us into a very nice next target, which I've got set to around a 111.20 at this stage, a very interesting level. Gold continues to defy any type of pullbacks similar to crypto. And you can see here that gold's running at 21.76, still got a really good weekly. I still think that pullbacks to be met by bull demand. I did see some CTA reduction over the last couple of reads. But at this stage, gold is still rallying, at least on the charts. And it's kind of the same thing for Bitcoin. You know, I've talked about that big sell-off we saw the other day, the 15%. Definitely a warning sign for me. The FOMO is pretty real. You're obviously trying to stop a freight train. At the moment, it still makes high highs and high lows. I wouldn't sell against Bitcoin. I would hodl if I was looking at you know a longer term during this cycle. I mean, we're not even at the halving cycle, and there's probably a lot more money to come in. However, you know, I do still think there'll be a cheaper price on the horizon. Looking at a 50k price for this one, back into that previous demand. Has it happened yet? No. Do I expect a flash crash on this thing? You always do on crypto. So remember, 15 to 25% crash like that, it's pretty normal. And even with the ETFs, you can see it can happen out of nowhere. So we're still looking for those types of reads. Now let's move over to US oil. A pretty nice movement here. And look at 80, it's coming in on it. UK oil as well is something that we obviously have been looking at. And that's an 84 read. And take a look, UK oil kind of did it for me. So this is a very big breach out of a very long-term coil. I mean, this thing's been sitting for a while in terms of coiling market. So what is kind of suggesting that maybe we've got rates going up, we'll find out. But really, oil, unless it's a false break, is looking for some big moves. On US oil, be looking for 82.50 to 84.50, which is something we've spoken about a lot. Energy stocks have obviously been doing really well. When you type in the energy sector in your market, oh, type it in properly, guys. Don't type it in wrong. There we go. You can see here, it's actually been breaching for now a little over a week and a half, and it's been quite nice. There's some nice trades on that. We've been talking about in our Market Masters Club and obviously talking about utilities and a few other sectors. There's always opportunity in these markets. You don't have to just trade AI. Remember, as a trader, you're looking for risk reward. And that's the thing. It's all about risk reward and abundance mindset. It's not really about, you know, it, you have to go and chase the biggest, hottest thing. You just need to be able to say, well, if I put $1,000 down, 
I'd like to generally make around 1,000 a minimum, 2,000, 3,000, obviously a better risk reward. And if you're doing that, and even if you're just coin flipping and you're making two to one, you would still be a huge winner overall. Let's move over to Tesla. So we talked about the idea that if we got a little bit of a rally through here, we were looking good for Tesla and then break through the high zone. Didn't happen. This stock keeps getting worse and it's moving down to the possible return point I've left on this chart for a long time. I'm not convinced that it's going to find a buyer just here. It closed on its low. That generally means there's more to come. And 164 remains that kind of key level. And it is a weekly low level that previously happened. So Tesla's really getting hit up here in the markets. The market is basically we're getting neutral. We're getting uh, downgrades on it, all sorts of things. Lots of getting smashed on this stock. However, it is coming into a very exciting zone for people that believe in this stock. So yeah, 164, I know a lot of people are discussing selling it. Yeah, I think it's only got a little bit in it to before it hits a really big demand. So we'll find out whether it keeps going down after that. Uh, but we're looking for structure. And of course, if we don't see structure in the markets, it's really just a guess and you're just buying the dip. And the problem is if we don't see structure, we're just not going to have that replication. Let's talk about NVIDIA. So in the pre-market, it actually hit my targets about 929, 930. Then it opened, then it went down. Then it rallied back up. Very strong stock. Obviously, we expect weakness in this area if it's going to come in. And we loved the buy the other day. And so far, so good. So I'm looking for this thing to get a little bit higher before it possibly has an issue. And it could be part of a DCB, which is a dead cap bounce. Um, and in basically what that means is it's a rally. It's more of a relief, but that this was a real sell. We don't know that yet. I mean, calling the top on something like a stock like this is really hard. Again, as an investor, I would personally not probably do anything. I'd be pretty happy with myself and my NVIDIA. So that's okay. Um, but, you know, you can be looking at it from a perspective of, if you were trading it the other day, this is a very interesting TP zone or scale out zone. SMCI is getting upgrades across the board, although it did have that number one big trade in it. So more to tell. The alert I'm going to set here is underneath 1020. So I'm just going to put an alert under there just in case it happens. Because of course, if it does, that's an area where I could see markets, you know, starting to weaken pretty heavily. Now let's move over to the one we spoke about in the last 24 hours. And that was PayPal. I did like this on the weekly. I thought it looked pretty good. And I had a feeling it was going to get some kind of relief from crypto, really, uh, because last time it did so, and we've seen Block also getting a little bit of that. Do I really think it should get relief from crypto? Not really, but it was holding this level of demand. And this could be part of a bigger breakout story. 4% on one session, nice breakout above the high, and a little bit more possibly to come. As you can see, if you go to a weekly, it's been really heavily beaten down. But I love the holds with the wicks, and I really like if this weekly ends up closing higher. Specifically, if it gets above this price point of 65 or 66, there's you know room to go to 75 for a stock like this. So some interesting stuff coming up. We'll set some alerts and we'll follow PayPal along. Another one that's given some great opportunities has been HSI. Obviously, we've been talking about KWeb. We've been talking about CQQ. These are China. This is the Hong Kong market, but generally it's just Chinese stocks. And they've been doing really well. Nice breakout here, obviously into resistance. I expect it to get through this zone though. And hopefully the next level for HSI is 18,000. A very nice run since we first reported on it over here. And it's now looking at about 12%, which is nothing to sneeze at when you're looking at an index. Let's now move over to the Aussie market, struggling because of iron ore, doing well because of energy and banks, uh, but iron ore really starting to hurt it. Is it a head and shoulders? Yeah, it could be. Um, has it broken through? No. Is this still a level of overall support? I'd say yes. So it's really going to come back to the US market for the Aussie market here, but it was a nice run. 7,800 was a big deal, and then it kept rallying up, and then of course it sold off. US 2K time now. Now, this one's still holding, uh, 2090. Obviously, I'm looking for a 2120 weekly close break. If that happens, I think it's really on for the Russell. It's going to be really exciting, but it's still just this ascending channel. So really, it's just at the moment in the middle of nowhere land when it sits around here. If it's a 2000, maybe I like it towards the buy side. If it breaks out, I like the momentum, but it's just sitting around. Speaking of channels, let's take a look at this one, the Kahuna, the one that's held this market pretty much since August of last year has just breached down. And what that's telling us is that the queues are starting to weaken. There's a clear rotation going on here. And effectively, it's not about the MAG-6 anymore or the MAG-7. It's now about 
the broader market. So the mid caps, the small caps, and the weird stocks. In potential, we're actually going a little bit defensive here. So of course, we'll be needing to look specifically at key zones, but there's no doubt that's a little breakdown. Hopefully it ends up holding if you are looking for a pullback. And that's gonna show that really the NASDAQ is the weaker of the indices, which you are seeing when you look at the charts. And we'll just zoom this in here so you guys can see it. We're looking for, of course, 17,780 to really show us that the market is, is weakened. But you can see it's starting to make a series of like weaker highs and now it's a lower high. So if it makes a lower low, that's not a great sequence for this particular pair. And I would expect it to probably start to sell off a little bit after that with giving some opportunities for dollar cost averages and other people out there. US 500, let's move over to that one now and load it up. If it ever loads, <laughs> let's just bring it up here on the charts. And you can see here that the US 500 remains very strong around that 51.75. Now, why is that? As we saw before, there's a call wall sitting on the 14th as well, which is all about options. So there's lots of options sitting here, lots of options sitting here in between this zone. You breach out, you're probably allowed to squeeze a bit more. The bulls are still in control of this market, there's no doubt. As I mentioned before, some of the key levels that I'm looking at, 50.95, 50.93, this low here, that would be a pretty big zone because this is basically a negative gamma area around that 5100. So we know that if the market goes underneath here and holds, it's going to force dealer books to potentially start to hedge their positions off. And that's going to force downward size movement. We haven't had that except for once really during this entire rally. Now, if we end up getting through 50-50, that's going to be the technical switch level, which we've spoken about, series of higher highs and higher lows. If we end up going a lower low, we would go through the 20 moving average, which has remained really the bullish pinnacle here. So some people would say this market's not been technical. I mean, really it has. We've talked about this 20 moving average forever. Every single time it comes here, it loves to buy it. And at this stage, it has remained it. I still think that you're better off in single stocks and sectors right now than the indices. Uh, but of course, it's up to you. A lot of people like indices out there. We use it more as a gauge. And at the moment, the gauge is single stocks and sectors. Let's talk maximum pain. So we can see here that call walls in particular on the 15th, 520, 522, 528, with of course 510, 500 being the two major put zones. Max pain is actually 495, which is well under where we are right now. Now, because there's trillions of dollars at stake, you could say, well, shouldn't we be able to get down there? Why can't we get down there? It has to get down there. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything, but it does become more likely that you get max pain in OPEX weeks. Now, that's probably unlikely this week based on the price action right now, but just remember that 5,200 level is going to be hard for the market to break through. So breaking through, it's probably going to mean hedging. At this stage, we basically have it as a res, just like we have 51.75 over the next 24 hours. So if you enjoyed today's video, please remember to give it a thumbs up, subscribe down below. And of course, thank you so much for watching and your comments are much appreciated. Bye for now.